All right, so let's get started. So introduction to Snowflake in Azure. I'm not going to scare you guys with a ton of different slides. I will go through a little bit of slides just to set the stage, but most most of it I wanted to use most of the hour and then go into Q&A because um, I figure if you know we have a small engaged audience, probably we'll have some good questions. And uh, I just want to show you demos, you know, just just go in the tool, we'll explore it, analyze it. I'll show you some functionality and hopefully um, pick the curiosity. I also want to take some time while I go through the demos into some of the things that I find people are finding interesting and why they decide to go with Snowflake versus going with some of the competitor tooling as well. So we'll talk on that as well. Okay. So. Um, what is Snowflake, right? So let's talk a bit about history. So Snowflake, the company, was founded in 2012, but the product wasn't available until 2014. So for two years, they were just building. And then in 2014, they made the product available to a few select companies that they had pitched it to them to work with them in private. And then it went general availability in 2015, only in AWS. So the beginning is AWS. Um, we'll go later on. Like now it's available on AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. But that was the first um, the first deployment was AWS only. So two of the three founders, something that's very interesting as well, as well is that they were data architects from Oracle. And what I found while using the product is that you can kind of see in the way that the product works that there were some really cool things that they probably thought, well, I'm not going to be able to do this in Oracle, or it would be nice if Oracle did this, and they decided to make them in Snowflake. So one of the key differentiators that I'm finding with people that come to us with interest in Snowflake is that Snowflake does a few things very well that they really like. And that you know sells the product, right? They are based in California. Before going public, just like I mentioned, like a month ago, um, they had raised more than 1.4 billion in venture capital, and they went public in the stock exchange. Uh, just uh, yeah, I think it's like about a month ago. And Salesforce and Berkshire Hathaway, for example, big investors as well. They raised another three billion in cash. So this is a company that is very well capitalized right now to really compete in the market, right? Um, it's not uh, a niche uh, little startup anymore at this point. They have a big cash war chest to basically build, continue building this solution to, you know, whatever their vision could be for, you know, they have enough cash probably to last them like 10 years. Um, interestingly, initially when it came out and just maybe only about a year ago, it was branded and called the Snowflake Data Warehouse. Now it has been rebranded, if you go to their website, it has been rebranded as the Snowflake Cloud Data Platform. And we'll go through what I think, why mostly they did this change. So what is it, right? It's a fully managed cloud data platform. So breaking that down, it's fully managed. So that means you don't deploy anything. It's all deployed by the vendor. You go in, you fill up a portal, a web portal. By the way, the trial is fantastic. Um, if you have access to Pluralsight, you go on my course, you can do the whole course with the trial. Uh, you don't pay a cent. It's it's really good trial, something that uh, it's, it's really nice. It's uh, 30 days and up to $400 um, dollars of use during those 30 days, which is like, you know, you'll be able to, you know, do like hundreds of hours of demo if you wanted to. So really good. It has a really good trial, um, but it is fully deployed by them, right? You don't have to deploy anything. You don't have to deploy VMs, nothing, no infrastructure. You don't have access to the underlying operating system. You don't have to worry about the hardware, right? It's, it's basically platform as a service. You just deploy, you worry about your Snowflake solution and creating your data warehouse or your data lake the way that you want it. You don't have to worry about all the other stuff, right? And obviously, you know, there's no need because you don't deploy anything. You don't have to worry about all the other stuff. There is no need for ongoing component administration either. And there is even not even that much to tweak or manage at the database level. There's a few things you can play around with. 
but there's not a ton, right? So it's not like something like, you know, when you deploy Oracle, for example, Oracle gives you a thousand parameters, so you can shoot yourself on the foot in a thousand different ways by setting those parameters wrong. And this is, uh, most of it is just with good defaults, you're not supposed to touch them. Um, and there's very little that you can actually do to like, you know, tune or like really deep manage the engine. It's, the idea is that you spend less time tuning or deep managing and you spend more time just coding SQL, creating reports, focusing on the business problems, right? Not on the database engine problems. It's cloud because it's in Azure, AWS and Google Cloud. And something that's really cool about it is that if you want and if you have the money, you can actually have it where it replicates between multiple clouds as well. So you could have, for example, again, the limit to what you can do is only limited by the size of your pockets. You could have, for example, a copy of your Snowflake data warehouse in Azure and another copy of your Snowflake data warehouse in AWS. And if you have some systems in AWS, they could be all right into the AWS copy. And then Snowflake will replicate that to your Azure copy. And then the same thing can be happening on your Azure side, for example. So you can have really cool low latency analytics on each one of the sites, replicate to each other so they both stay in sync. And even do disaster recovery. If you have to, you could fail over one to the other. So really, really cool. Obviously, you know, you're, you're, the moment you do that, you're spending double, obviously, because you're moving from one region to a completely different cloud provider and everything. But it's something that you can do, right? So that's that's really neat capability. It has tight integration with the cloud storage, right? Being a, a product that you deployed in one of these cloud providers, you can easily work with S3. It will work with Azure Blob Storage or with the new Azure Data Lake Gen 2, and it works with Google Cloud Storage as well. And why is it a platform? I kind of like really, you know, why did they switch to rebranding themselves as a platform? Well, because it's, it's not just a data warehouse. So it has a data warehouse engine, an MPP data warehouse engine, right? Where you add more machines. It's not just bigger and bigger and bigger machines. It's a cluster of machines. But now it also has data lake capabilities. So you can create what is known as external tables, for example. So you can read data from your S3 bucket or your Azure data lake storage and give it shape inside Snowflake and query it from Snowflake without actually taking that data into Snowflake itself, right? So it has data lake capabilities as well. It has data processing capabilities. So as long as you can land the data on cloud storage, the Snowflake gives you tools to pull it from cloud storage and then working with it in Snowflake. Something that's very important to understand, I had a couple of clients that were kind of like, you know, a little bit confused by this, is they thought that Snowflake also had tools to do extraction from other databases. So like, for example, uh, like an ETL tool to do extraction from SQL or Oracle and then move that into Snowflake. So that's something that Snowflake doesn't provide today, right? Maybe now that they have all this cash, they'll develop their own ETL or they'll buy an ETL developer or something like that so they can really have everything in one solution, but it doesn't have that today. So you, need, you still need another tool, whatever your ETL tool might be, to move your data from your uh, sources, whether it's SQL, Oracle, MySQL, whatever they may be, or flat files, into cloud storage or directly into Snowflake, and then Snowflake can take it from there, right? But you still need something to extract that data, those data sources. Um, and then finally, it does something that it does really well that I don't think the other competitors, Good BigQuery, Redshift, Azure Synapse are doing as well is the data sharing piece. And I want to show you guys, I'll show you guys in the demo what that looks like because I think what they've done for the data sharing is very, very neat in terms of how they want to enable enterprise data sharing. So I'll show you guys that. All right. In terms of connectors, like what does it support? You can connect uh, Python, it has Spark as well, it has Kafka connectors as well. For drivers, it has a JavaScript, a Node driver, Go driver, .NET, JDBC, ODBC, so pretty much you know any of the big um, 
any of the major uh, languages can talk to Snowflake in any in some way. Um, third party application support, of course, you know, some I, somebody was just saying that they just they're they're using Snowflake with Power BI, but any of the other big players, Tableau, Salesforce, Looker, Click, uh, you name it, they all have support for Snowflake at this point as well. So they have a they've built a strong partner ecosystem already. And I wanted to show you guys this. I, unfortunately, I couldn't find. I don't know if Gardner did a data uh, data management solutions for analytics quadrant this year because I was looking online and I couldn't find any. So I don't know. Maybe COVID hit, and then Gardner didn't get a chance to make a quadrant for analytics this year. So I'm, I'm showing you guys the quadrant from last year, right? So I'm expecting probably that Snowflake will move towards this corner a little bit more next time they do this quadrant you see last time that they did the quadrant it was here um uh, interestingly for example you can still see teradata a little bit above in the ability to execute but really far in completeness of vision right because teradata has been uh, around for a very very long time right but i've gotten a lot of interest in the last few months of a lot of people that have, for example, have Teradata on premises and they don't want to refresh their Teradata hardware or their Teradata licensing and they're not interested in the Teradata cloud and they want to try Snowflake, for example, instead, right? So I think this quadrant is going to look really interesting next time that Gardner puts it together. And like you can see, for example, Cloudera is now the same company as Hortonworks. Right, so this will be just one now, um, and honestly, I'm seeing a lot of people moving away from Cloudera, Hadoop type of implementation, like doing their own thing. Um, I would expect Databricks, for example, to show up here next time instead as well. So a lot of this is a very, very moving, hot industry right now, as I mentioned. Right, lots of opportunity and potential for people like us to be able to capture this market. So the main competition, of course, is the big three uh, cloud providers. They all have their own database or sorry, data warehouse or data lake as a service uh, service. So AWS has had Redshift for a while. 2014 came out six years ago. Um, GCP has BigQuery, which is a very interesting product as well. And Azure had Azure SQL Data Warehouse that just got rebranded. When was that? Maybe about a year ago into Azure Synapse, right? And Synapse Analytics is, is the new service that bundles the um, uh, SQL Data Warehouse engine with uh, the Spark. So it does have tough competition, right? Because it's competing against these three huge companies, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft in this same space. But I've still found some people that we've done the analysis with them, we've done due diligence with them, and even though they are in AWS, they didn't want to go with Redshift. They went with Snowflake. Or even though they're in Google, they didn't want to go with BigQuery. They went with Snowflake. And same with Azure Synapse. They said, no, we like Synapse. Maybe we'll use Synapse for the Spark piece. But for the MPP main uh, data warehouse engine, we're going to go with Snowflake. So there is an angle there where they can still differentiate themselves, um, even with this you know, really tough competition, of course. This is what I think is Snowflake's niche for people that are not um, super familiar with it. And for the people that are already running it in, in your own companies, because I know there's a couple here, I, I would like to hear at the end of the session, why do you, do you guys select it? Or, or if you don't know exactly why, why do you think it was selected? So people that think that are interested or companies that are interested in cross cloud, single source of truth, Right, the ability, that ability that I said to have your data warehouse be in two different clouds and replicate at the same time, that to me is the home run scenario. If somebody says, I have the pockets and I want that, then Snowflake is, this is what you want to run because it's easy to do, it's, it works great, and uh, yeah, and, you, and you're not going to have Synapse Analytics running in AWS, right? Same as you're not going to have Redshift running in Synapse. And now Google BigQuery is doing something interesting. They have a product now called BigQuery Omni, but it's not exactly the same. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole, but um, if somebody is, is uh, interested in it, 
Um, you can Google it later, Google BigQuery Omni, and you'll see what Google is trying to do to try to put BigQuery in their competitors uh, space. Um, I found that Snowflake is a very user friendly uh, for their web environment. If you're doing a little bit of admin, if you're doing querying, it's very simple to use. It has a bunch of really neat little things that it does in the interface. I'll show you guys in the demo that I thought are really cool from the user experience perspective. It's a really easy to understand and contain billing model, so it's not complicated to understand what your bill is going to be. Um, you're built basically on storage and compute. And I'll go a little bit in once we're doing the demos into what you actually pay for the compute, because that's also really cool. Um, and you don't really need to do a lot of technical decisions to just start, you know? Sometimes it's you're like, well, I got to run a data warehouse, I got to run a data lake, which components should I select? Oh my God, like how do I integrate it, et cetera, et cetera. So if a client doesn't have a lot of IT or it doesn't have a lot of, you know, super expert staff, this is a great solution to sell them. Say, you know, you can do the initial implementation and then they can probably manage it for themselves and give you a call if they need some help. You know, it's, I found that it's also a very mm, starter friendly model as well. In terms of the billing, you can start using Snowflake and be really productive with Snowflake and get value for your company out of Snowflake while keeping a very small uh, bill. So that's something that I found really, really interesting compared to some of the other ones like Redshift or BigQuery or Synapse. Um, and then the final thing is that it has a very friendly dev experience. It has some really cool features in terms of dev experience. For example, if you want to do time travel, so that's the ability to see data in the past or to undo changes in the data. If you want to do cloning, so if you want to, for example, you know, let's say you have a, um, a data warehouse that's, you know, two terabytes. And some developer says, oh, I need to do a developer copy because I got to do some changes to run a test. Like, what do you do if you're running on premises? You know, you got to copy the whole two terabytes to another system because he's going to start doing stuff to it. That's a lot of, you know, resources that you might end up wasting time, probably also that you're going to be end up waiting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So the clones that Snowflake creates are, are zero copy clones. So um, if somebody, for example, uh, you know, let's say the same developer, two terabytes of data, he clones the data warehouse and then he only changes a few rows in the entire data warehouse. The footprint of the clone is only the change. It's only the few rows that they change. It's not the full two terabytes. And the Snowflake engine under the covers, when that developer queries, merges both images to show the results. So it's really neat that way it works, right? Because it keeps the, again, the billing, right? It keeps the storage costs down, but providing a really fast and quick development experience, right? And then it has this idea of virtual warehouses, which I'll show in the demo. Which it basically means is that multiple people can be working against the same data, but with completely isolated clusters. So you have your main reports, you can run them on one virtual warehouse, and then you have your developers doing some other crazy stuff against the same copy of the data warehouse, and they run it in their own compute space, in their own virtual warehouse, and they don't impact your actual production workload at all. So that's if you want to give developers, for example, read-only copy into your production virtual warehouse, you can do it in a way that is very safe because you, you can provide read-only permissions and their own virtual warehouse so they don't touch your resources for production stuff at all. Anybody that's an admin here, I'm pretty sure would love that feature. All right. Uh, in particular, uh, why do I think it's good on Azure? So. Right now, I would say if, if a client comes to me and they don't have any cloud at all, I would make them choose between AWS or Azure. On Google right now, there's a couple of features that are missing, um, and it's not deployed on as many regions as it is on the other two. So, you know, if they are really want Snowflake in Google, I mean, you can make it happen, but it's not something that I would really recommend right away, just because, you know, again, this, there's some, a couple of features that are missing. Um, some sweet stuff that works well in Azure is it's really easy to integrate the Azure AD with a single sign-on in Snowflake, for example. It can do SCIM, which is a system for cross-domain identity management. So you basically, you can create a user in your Azure AD and put it in a Snowflake role 
and it will automatically create their user in Snowflake and give it all the right permissions. So that's something that's really neat as well. Um, it's integrated with blob storage, data lake storage. I'll show you guys that in the demo in a little bit, how that works. Um, it's very, very it's simple. Once you set it up, it actually works really well and it's really well encapsulated. Um, security wise as well is very well um, designed and uh, you can still use it. You know, if you want to decide, well, I'd like Azure Synapse 2 or like Azure Databricks, um, you can still use it together with Snowflake, right? So Databricks can um, use the Spark connector to, Syn to Snowflake. Synapse can also use the Spark connector to Snowflake. If you're using Synapse pipelines that uses the Azure Data Factory engine under the covers, that can also connect um, to Snowflake. So there's a built-in connector for Azure Data Factory for Snowflake already. Um, you can always use data lake storage as an intermediate layer, you know, crunch some data in Synapse Spark, for example, put it in data lake storage, and then Snowflake can read it off of data lake storage and stuff like that, right? So it's easy to integrate with all these different services. So I find Azure is a good place. If you like some of the other Azure stuff or the stuff that Microsoft is doing, or if you already have, for example, your Office 365 and your Azure AD is already all populated, then it's like super easy to set up single sign-on and everybody can log on to Snowflake using their Azure identities. So that's pretty neat as well. All right, so that's it. I'm not going to bore you guys with any more slides. I think I said enough. I'm just going to go in and show you guys. Um, and uh, and yeah, let's let's show you what this looks like. So if you have any questions as we go along, uh, please just let me know. Give me a second here. I want to find my zoom it. Where did I put it? Zoom it. Uh, let me see. I'll find it. Desktop. Oh my God, we'll zoom it. I swear I had it here in this somewhere. All the, oh my goodness. Downloads maybe. Zoom it, there it is. Uh -huh. All right, cool. So back to this. All right, so this is what you get when you log into Snowflake. Right now they're kind of in a transition phase. So you see here there's a button right here at the top. It says preview app. I'll go. I'm gonna show you guys both experiences because right now, like I said, they're kind of in a transition where they have this this initial web portal they created, and now some of the experience of the product is moving into this um, new experience that in, in the documentation is referred to as Snow Site, and basically allows you to do other newer stuff or the newer features are coming into this experience as opposed to um, this this other um, portal, but it's okay. We'll go back and forth and I'll show you some of the other st the stuff um, as, as we go along on both on both interfaces. So first thing to notice here, so I have at the top databases, shares, the data marketplace. I'll go through all these and show you guys kind of like the different concepts as, as we go. Of course, you can have databases, right? This is something that we would expect. Uh, interestingly, if you guys see here, there are some databases that say they have an origin and others that they don't. So what is this? So first of all, is that some of them, like this one called reviews or demos or utilities, these are the databases that I created on my Snowflake account. So they don't have an origin, it means they, they come from myself. But these other ones that do have origins, it means that they are they basically get materialized into my account from somebody else's data. So that's something really cool. It's a part of that, how Snowflake allows that enterprise data sharing, right? So somebody over in um, their Snowflake account keeps a weather database. And you guys see here, you know, I have it, they have it here set weather data in Azure, weather source, and I don't pay for this storage, for example, right? They're the ones paying for it. I just have read-only access to it. I got it through the, the Snowflake Marketplace. I'll show you guys in a little bit what that looks like. So basically, I have the ability to consume data from other people, add it to my account, and have it here. I can even do a cross-database join if I wanted to. But this is data that doesn't belong to me, right? So for example, let's say you have a partner and your partner saying, oh, well, you know, I really want or I really wish if we could share this particular data set. And usually people, you know, end up setting up 
like uh, awful replication topologies or they export flat files and then send them over to FTPs and all this kind of other stuff. Well, it's, if, if the partner, for example, is open to, hey, why don't you, have you heard of Snowflake? Maybe you can just create an account there. It's very cheap. You can run compute for $1 an hour. Uh, you know, if you only use it uh, a couple of hours a day to pull the data that's new, you just pay two bucks per day. Um, and then you basically don't have to do anything. You just have to keep your copy in sync and the client will be able to import your database into their account in a read-only way, right? So that's pretty cool. Um, then, and that's enabled by this capability called shares, right? So you guys can see here, there's inbound shares and then there's outbound shares, right? So the inbound shares, you can see uh, the inbound shares that I have, these two at the bottom, sample data that just it's a uh, sample data that snowflake makes available to everybody when you open an account it's a uh, tpc data and there's account usage this is actually your account usage data so snowflake in their you know instrumentation layer they keep usage of all their account information and they share it back to you as a data share and this one is an inbound data share like i said i just got it from the data marketplace and i'll show you guys what the data marketplace looks in a little bit and then I also have an outbound data share I created just as part of a demo. And I basically what I did is I bundled a bunch of different objects in my data share. So you can see, uh, let me see if I go to edit. You can see uh, here the views and the tables. Obviously, in this case, it's just a small demo. Um, but you can see, for example, I added a table called uh, businesses and a view called top businesses secure. Um, so once I create this object, I could tell again, let's do the example of my partner. I say, hey, partner, I'm going to add you to my um, data share and they don't get access to the whole reviews database. They only get access to this table and to this one view and that's all they can see. Right, so that's pretty cool. They can only uh, access that data. And if I do any changes to the businesses table or any changes to the underlying data that is used to compute this view, then that's what my partner will be able to see, right? So very, very neat. Um, yeah, so that's database and shares. The other stuff that's really fundamental is that warehouses thing that I mentioned. And the warehouses worked really interesting. So right now I have two, two warehouses, right? So you can uh, size them. Let's go through one of these. Actually, let's pretend that we're going to create one. So you give it a name and you see they have they have t-shirt sizes. So they go from extra small all the way to four extra large. And the way that this works, you guys can see here, it says one credit an hour. Snowflake is divided into four different tiers there's standard snowflake enterprise snowflake business critical snowflake and what's known as virtual private snowflake virtual private snowflake is the most expensive one uh, and it basically means that you are running your own uh, private snowflake in the cloud um, the, all the other ones it's it's a multi-tenant uh, scenario that you share with the other snowflake accounts in the cloud that they manage Obviously, you never have access to anybody else's data, um, but uh, that's that's just the way it is, right? So uh, the way that this works or the billing works is if you have standard Snowflake, then the one credit per hour is just literally $1. If you have enterprise Snowflake, then the one credit per hour is $2. If you have business critical Snowflake, then one credit per hour is $4. $4. And there's different things that are enabled here, right? So for example, in standard Snowflake, you have one day of time travel. So you can only go back one day into how your data looked like, right? If you need to roll back or you just need to you know, do a report from the past or whatever. An enterprise, you can tweak it. You can have up to 90 days, right? So that's something, a feature that's enterprise, you will be paying more per hour to have it. On business critical, for example, you can bring your own key for encryption at rest. That's another feature that you will be paying for. And so one credit will be $4 per hour. That's pretty much the billing model. And then you can see they all double as they go up, right? So small is two credits, four, eight, 16, all the way to 128. 
obviously like you know this would be really expensive right but but you can always resize them right so think about it right so um let's assume the the craziest scenario right you have a couple of petabytes already loaded in snowflake you have a massive corporate report that has to come out at a specific time every month it needs to the data cuts at midnight and it's got to be out by 1 a.m right so what do you do well you just suck it up and you say well let's say you have an enterprise snowflake to make it simple so for one hour you change this warehouse to 128 credits and suddenly you're paying 128 dollars an hour to run it but it's per second billing so let's say it only took 30 minutes to make your report then you paid the cost to compute that report for that really tight window for that huge data set was only then 64 bucks right so it is flexible it's a flexible model you can play around with it and you don't have to think about you know the sizes as in like you're getting married to that size right you can switch and the moment the report is done you're like ah back to extra small and you're back to paying one credit per hour right um yeah so that's the way it works and you can switch back and forth the way uh, as you want now there's something else really cool is that you can see here where it says minimum clusters and maximum clusters so a snowflake has this feature there's a feature of enterprise snowflake that if you have an unexpected workload and your cluster gets really busy it can actually spawn more clusters under the covers and reassign that workload so that's really cool something that i can do and then it also has auto suspend and auto resume so you can set it to auto suspend if nobody has run a query let's say for 10 minutes right and you can set it to auto resume so that if at any point in time that the warehouse goes to sleep to save you money then next time that somebody tries to run a query it will automatically wake up Right, so that's pretty cool as well. So you don't have to keep it on the whole time and you don't have to be pausing it yourself, which is the problem that Azure SQL Data Warehouse has, for example. It has pause, but it doesn't auto pause. It's just you have to go in and pause it yourself, right? So this is a lot easier. You just said, you know, if 10 minutes of idle, then suspend it and I stop paying for it, right? So that's pretty cool. All right. And as I mentioned before, you can point these different virtual warehouses at the same database and they don't compete in resources, right? So you can say, for example, I hear it's a classic scenario. This is the minimum that everybody should do. Everybody, if you're really gonna be using it, should have at least two virtual warehouses, one for compute of regular querying and one for loading data, right? So that's the bare minimum that you should have as your team grows or you have different business units using it or different type of roles maybe you want to give a virtual warehouse just to the data scientist or a virtual warehouse just to the business analyst etc cetera, etc cetera, then you can create create more right um but at, at the very beginning at least you can have two so that the data loading it has its own resources and doesn't impact uh, the querying right and it's very easy to create and if like I said, if they're not running because people are not using them, then they just go back to sleep and you don't spend much money. So for example, if you have um, ETL that only runs, you know, four times per day and it only needs 20 minutes to run, then, you know, at the end of the day, you will only be paying for 80 minutes of the whole day to have your data load cluster running. And you don't have to manage it, right? You just simply, you fire the ETL, uh, when it connects into the Snowflake, Snowflake will wake up your data load virtual warehouse. It will load the data, and then in five, after five minutes of inactivity, it'll just go back to sleep, right? So that's pretty neat. Um, and then it also has some really cool things it does. For example, you guys can see here, right? If I go right now, you'll see it says suspended, right? So they're both sleeping. I can go here, and I'm connected right now. You guys can see here, I'm connected to um sysadmin i have this set to this compute warehouse and i have this reviews demo database i i use it in my plural site course as well and i can say you know show tables for example and oh it gives me the list of all the tables 
and I can get the table count, the row counts, sorry. So you can see here, I have three tables, businesses, reviews, users, 377,000 records. This one has a million records for the reviews, uh, the size of the table, etc. cetera. Um, and if I go back to warehouses, you'll see they're still suspended, right? So that's pretty cool. So basically what happens is that Snowflake keeps all this metadata about, and you can do other things here. Like for example, you can do a show databases as well. I think. Yeah, and you, Snowflake keeps all this metadata about your databases and your tables in a layer that's above the virtual warehouses. So if you are just exploring um, your schema, you can even see here, for example, I can go in, open public tables, I can go on, businesses right there and you can see the schema here at the bottom right you guys will see i can see my fields all that stuff i go back to the warehouses and you'll see they're still suspended right so a lot of the times think about how many times you just before you actually start working on anything you're just exploring what's in there you're looking at the tables you're looking at row counts you're looking at the fields you're looking at how they might relate to each other all this information in Snowflake is stored in a metadata layer that's on top of the virtual warehouses. So you're not actually consuming virtual warehouse compute when you are just exploring the metadata in your um, account. So I thought that was really neat because it encourages people to basically explore for free, right? Um, so that's something that's really cool. Um, you can't do this, for example, in Synapse or in Redshift. Um, I don't know if you can do it in BigQuery, to be honest, because BigQuery is paper query, but I know for sure you can't do it in Synapse or Redshift. Like you have to be paying for compute to be able to just do exploration, right? Um, so that's something that I find really cool. Um, and that's something that I find that's also very developer friendly, of course, because it keeps the cost of dev down. Um, something else that's really neat, I'll show you guys right now. I have a, a couple of queries here. So let me just show you guys here, for example. Now I'm really going to run a query, so we're going to wake up my warehouse. So I'm just going to head. Let's let that run. All right, so I have my my query here. It's just a correlated subquery. Um, basically, I have the businesses ordered by their average star rating, okay, and limit of 20. So I only grabbed 20. Um, and we can go back here. You guys can see. Oh. Cute warehouse, woke up, it started, all right? This is what we expect, right? Now look, the cool thing here as well is that, let's say I go here and I say, oh, suspend. I'm gonna suspend it, yeah. So let's assume that it wasn't because I just suspended it. Let's assume that it was because um, the idle time passed or whatever, right? So you can see it's suspended now. Um, but if I go back to my worksheet, I just grab this. I can even copy paste this. Uh, so it's a new connection, right? I can run this. Oh, I gotta put the database reviews and run. And I get this and you can see I go back and this still suspended. Huh? That's cool too. So, and I can refresh. So you guys can see it's not that, oh, I just, uh, just it's just cache saying that it's suspended. No, it is really suspended because it also has a results cache that sits on top of the virtual warehouses. So if, for example, you decided that you ran some queries in the morning and for whatever reason, you just log back into your Snowflake account three hours later and you run the exact same queries, as long as the underlying data hasn't changed, Snowflake can use that results cache to give you back your results without having to compute them again. And because it doesn't have to compute them again, it won't start the warehouses. And it's completely transparent to you, right? You just have to run this, um, the query. Now, if I wanna change this query in any way, so for example, if I say now, I want to grab 25 instead of 20, and I run this, then now if we go back to the warehouses, you guys will see we woke it up. Right, so the query has to be, oh, sorry, switch tabs. I wanted to switch to this. The query has to be exactly the same. If the query is not exactly the same, then obviously the cache doesn't apply. But 
is still pretty cool. If you have the same query, you don't even have to have compute running, right? It will serve it off the cache layer, and that cache layer sits above your virtual warehouse, and you don't have to have compute running to grab the same query. Now, think about this. People think, well, yeah, that's cool, um, but you know, just you know, a few developers maybe that will want to repeat a query or whatnot. Not necessarily, right? Let's say, for example, you have something like a dashboard that you populate. Um, uh, during the day for some reason and you can repopulate it for multiple people during the day and only pay for the compute um, power of the dashboard once as long as your data is not changing of course but let's say you know your data only changes once per day or your data only changes there half a day maybe at midnight and at noon or something like that then it has an actual use once you you know realize how many times you will be saving yourself from waking up that virtual warehouse, then there is an actual monetary saving that is there, right? So I thought that was pretty, pretty cool feature as well. Uh, and at any point in time, you can actually get these back as well. So um, each query has a, each query has a query ID. So I'm just gonna paste this here. So you can you can query your results cache by using this query ID as well. So not even you don't have to like remember exactly the same um, the same um, text of the of the SQL. Though most people will probably don't even most people probably won't even realize they're using the query um, that they're using the the query cache. But if you do have a specific query in mind, you just want to get the results back as well, then you can get them by just referencing the query ID as well. So that's pretty neat too. Um, yeah. All right, so that's something that I think was pretty cool. Um, then the other thing, let me show you guys as well. Let me show you guys the data marketplace. Actually, no, let me show you the worksheets because this the worksheets also have a pretty neat, um, couple of pretty neat uh, GUI functionalities that I think are are nice. So let's see. Oh, I have something preloaded here already. Okay. So here I grabbed uh, reviews and I grabbed them. Uh, I put a limit 100. So it's going to show me just 100 reviews from the review table. Now let's look at some of the neat stuff that this uh, interface does. So if you guys can see here, it actually gives you a breakdown, graphical breakdown of the different fields on this sidebar, right? So you can see here um, the stars, you know, the uh, the breakdown of how many stars were from one um, to five, uh, how many, uh, the column, the useful column, you know, how many items were considered um, uh, have useful set to zero. Uh, there's a lot of people that didn't, you know, think the reviews are useful in this <laughs> but anyway that's just a function of the data um, and you can see here right and then like uh, go explore basically your data graphically right away on the on the interface right and you can check for example the stars is the same thing you want to see from one all the way to five right and you can see here the well the sum of the stars is not really interesting but you can see the average stars here it's four, right? And you can select it. And once you select it, it gives you a account of this particular value over the total, and it automatically filters it on the results for you, right? So that's something that's also pretty neat if you're playing around with, you know, you're just, again, it encourages exploration of the data because you don't really have to do anything. You just have to go in on the field that you're interested in and you can you know break it down in different ways right so here we're in 2016 okay the reviews that are in this particular uh, date range and um you can actually click on it you can change it right so i wanted to do march let's say and now i just filtered into a subset of that data right away so i just wrote a very general query right in terms of sql and this is again the exploration use case i just wrote a very general query in terms of sql and then the rest i can try to drill down and explore on a graphical nice way without having to be retyping 
uh, a lot of really similar change a bunch of predicates at the same time on the on the code screen right so i think that's something that's really neat that happens here on the uh, on the uh, interface um yeah so this is the the worksheet it also has some charts capabilities so this is getting very popular right now obviously if you guys are in the microsoft data space um, azure data studio allows you to manipulate the results as charts now um, synapse analytics also has this capability to manipulate the results by charts right you can switch the fields you can add columns you can change the orientations if you want it to be bars you can of course change what it is if instead of bars you want to see scatter plot if you want to see lines if you want to see heat grid or scorecard well i guess the scorecard is not that exciting but you could change something else here you can add another column and instead of being the sum of the stars or whatever it is right but easily so the point being here of course is that you can get some you know if somebody just wants to get a quick chart of the results you don't have to really switch yourself into a different tool you can just mock something up here and then um share it right and you can actually even share it on uh, a dashboard so there is actual dashboard functionality so you can get uh, any result of a query you can pin it into a dashboard and then you can just share those dashboards with your collaborators that are on snowflake as well right so that's something pretty pretty easy as well this is not going to be a replacement uh, not at this point again i don't know what they're going to do with their new three billion but at this point obviously the functionality is a lot uh, limited compared to what you would be able to build in any of the big bi players tableau looker click power bi etc but you know if you're not trying to do something super complicated somebody that already has snowflake as well you can just quickly share a dashboard native here in snowflake and not have to go into an outside tool to do it right all right i want to show you guys as well the data marketplace so that's an interesting thing and that's where i got my weather data so snowflake allows people to register as data providers right so if i go down here for weather you'll see this is where i got mine the weather source right and the idea here is that um if you have a data set that you own that you have the rights to distribute that is legal for you to distribute right not like your patient's data or something like that um then you can publish it in snowflake and make money out of it right so you guys will see here i have this global weather and climate data i can go on it and it gives me the description of um the data sets and what they include and then even some examples of usage and all that stuff and if i want to use it it's really easy well here now it says view instead of get because i already have this one in my database um but if uh and if if you wanted to get a personalized then you can press here where it says request right and then when it says request it basically says hey mr data provider i liked that weather data set that you have for the top uh 10 populated cities in the united states which i think is what it has in the free one now i want to know like do you have it for all the cities in canada for example right and then that way that's how they make money right or how you can make money right it's uh you you sell the personalized data set so you provide a free data set as a sample and a hook and then uh, you can buy the personalized data set or like the unlock the full version i guess depending on your data set from the data provider okay so that's a pretty cool idea and that allows you to again if you are consuming data then it allows you to quickly find a partner that you want to consume data from or if you have again data that's your own that you think can be monetized then it's a it's a place to sell it now the really cool thing about it is that this idea can be done in a private scenario too so this is where i think that they're really shining on the data sharing space that their competitors are lagging and, and it makes a big difference for example here you guys can see i have this manage and a demo data exchange if i click on it 
Let's see, I have a listing of my reviews data set, right? And I can click on it and you see, I have a review data set and click view on exchange. So basically what happens is that I can create my own data exchange and I can share it with my partners, or let's say you're in the business intelligence team in your company, you can share the data exchange with the rest of the whole company. And the rest of the whole company, when they think, oh, I wonder if we have data for X, Y, Z, they can go into the data, the private company data exchange and look at all the listings from the data and you can provide them with a description. You can provide them with how uh, how often this gets refreshed. You can give them examples of how they can use your data set, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then when it's time to use them, all they got to do is um, import it into their Snowflake account, right? And this obviously here is uh, I just have one demo one because it's just my demo, but you can expect, right, if I had more than one, I will have my demo data exchange and I could have like, you know, all the different cards here for all the different data sets and I could search them and all that stuff. So this is really, really neat because again, like I said, it allows you to um, publish, you know, in a governed, controlled way all your enterprise data sets to the rest of your company or to your outside partners but at the same time allow them to consume them as self-service right you don't have to be doing this managing this yourself you just make the listing and that's it and you give them access to your data exchange and that's it and they can self-service them you know if they like this particular listing go ahead create a database from it and I have another account here, I'll show you guys right now. So I have another account here in Snowflake and let me go into the preview experience. So this is uh, another account that I own that I have given permission into my data exchange. So you guys can see here, right? So this account has the, the Snowflake official data marketplace and they have my demo data exchange. They can go in here and when they go in here, they will be able to see all the listings that I have and they can just click right there and they, you know, if they want to check it out, they can see it and whatnot, right? So really, really easy. Now they can go in, they can check. These are the two objects, right? Even though I have you know, I remember you guys uh, that I created that data share. Um, they just have access to the objects that I specifically give them access to, right? I'm not giving them access to the whole database. I define the data set. I created a listing that describes the data set and I gave access through the demo exchange self-service to um, this client to be able to do whatever it is they want to do with it. Read only, of course, right? So I think this is a really neat way to solve that problem of, oh my God, like how do we, you know, expose all these data sets that we have all over the enterprise to everybody, right? Like Power BI is trying to solve that problem as well, but that that kind of just moves that problem and I'm, Tableau, all these other visualization tools, they all trying to solve this problem as well. But that just kind of like, moves that problem into the tool itself, right? What if I want to, you know, use something else to analyze the data set? Oh, I can't because it's a Power BI data set, right? Um, if I move that capability into the warehouse itself, then any tool can use it, right? So that's the really neat part about it. And at the same time, it's all governed. So I can go back and, you know, I only give I don't mix up who has access to what. Let me see. Settings. Uh, forget how you do this. There. So you guys can see I'm I'm the provider. Well, I, I'm both in this case, right? But this account that I'm on right now, I'm the admin and I'm the provider in this data exchange. And I added that other account that I have just as a consumer, right? And if I want to, I can go in, remove this account as a consumer because they 
are not our partner anymore, so they don't get our data anymore, and uh, the Snowflake under the covers will sever the link, and they can't query our data anymore, right? So pretty cool. And it's all, like I said, once you set up your listings, it's all managed by Snowflake. You don't have to do anything from your point of view. Just give them permission to consume from your data exchange. And after that, it's up to them to self-service, right? So that's pretty neat. All right. Um, I guess, let's see, we saw the worksheets, the dashboards, the data exchange. Um, account, I'll show you a couple of things here on the account. So obviously, you know, you get your uh, instrumentation of how much you're spending, the space that you're consuming. Um, there's a couple of, of cool features like resource monitors. So for example, this allows you to have quotas of usage. So you guys can see here, I have a couple. So basically I have an account quota. I don't want to spend any single month. I don't want to spend over three credits, even though like three credits is just like 12 bucks. But you know, it's my demo environment. So I set up a really small alert so I don't go crazy on it. Um, and I also have a quota for my compute warehouse, the one that I use just for queries, right? And you can set it to what to do, what happens, right? So it, it, let's see this one, for example. This one says, it's a credit quota is three. I've used only 162. I still have 138 to go. It's monthly. So as soon as November 1st comes in, the this this will reset back to zero, right? It will restart the counter. And you can see the actions that I can take when that quota is hit, right? So I can do a suspend when it hits 100%, or I can do a suspend immediately when it hits 150%. That kind of is like, well, what does that mean? Like suspend, but it can go to 150% and suspend immediately. So basically what happens is, let's say you have a warehouse and you're running a query, let's call it Q1, and I send a suspend, right? So I sent a suspend message because right? it hit that three. Let's say it hit the three credits. All right, but suspend, what it does is that it waits for the last query to be done and then it shuts down the database. So what I'm basically saying here is what is 50% of three is 1.5. So I'm allowing Q1 to continue running up until the moment that it hits 4.5 credits. And once it hits 4.5 credits, if Q1 is still running, then it's going to be suspended immediately. It gets killed, and then the warehouse goes down, right? So it allows you not, it's not just a on or off button. It allows you to play a little bit with what might be happening when you hit the quota, right? So in this case, in like this strategy that I use is, you know, Let's just put a little bit more in the suspend immediate to give a chance for the things that might be running to finish before we kill it. But we also have to put some sort of value on suspend immediate because I also don't want to give them a chance to run forever until the end of time and drive my bill up like crazy, right? So that's something that I find is pretty cool as well, the resource monitors. There's also the ability to notify. So if let's say you want to, you can set a threshold for notify, I don't know, like 50%. So when it goes to 50, it'll just shoot you an email instead of doing anything, just so it's like a heads up kind of thing. And then the other feature that I think is really neat as well that I want to show you guys is this feature of a reader account. So what a reader account does is basically is it gives a full independent reader access to your account, to someone else, and you are on the hook for the bill for them. So this could be a way, for example, to, and let's say you have like a big corporation and every, uh, maybe there's like subsidiaries or something like that. And then there's, you know, the corporate EDW, then you could create reader accounts for the different subsidiaries and they could all um, have their own independent account, but they're allowed to read into the corporate one, and the corporate one would be the one that is paying the bill for everybody else, right? So I think that's kind of like a neat, a neat way to basically have 
uh, a parent account and a bunch of children read only accounts and these children read only accounts they are separate accounts so they have you know you can set them up with their own security and stuff um so that's, that's something else that's that's pretty cool um what else other than that i mean there's other stuff that is just normal right the policies for example you can set some ip addresses or blocks some ip addresses in this case if you guys looked on mine uh Oh, I just pressed Visual Studio Code. That's not what I wanted to open. It's right there next to the other icon. Um, if you guys um, can see here when I log out of this one, for example, just log myself out. Uh, oh no, this is the reader account. So let me log myself out of this main one. This one you'll see it says login using Azure ID. So that one I already have it set up with Azure IDs and it's, uh, the process, it's all very simple. I'll just go into my Azure portal and show you guys. Um, so if you go to Azure Active Directory, Enterprise Apps, uh, if you guys will see here, Snowflake is already in the Azure portal. You just have to search. You go into Enterprise Apps, you search for Snowflake, you validate yourself into Snowflake, and you have access to do single sign-on. Very simple to operate as well. Um, so those integrations are already there, set up for you. Um, yeah, and then there's not a lot of work to do. You can just follow, it's like wizard style to set it up. And yeah, it works really well. All right, and yeah, it's uh, 7.47. I think I've talked for a long time and you guys have seen quite a bit now. So maybe let's just take the last 10 minutes just for, for Q&A. And I wanna hear a little bit about um, some of the people that are using Snowflake, what their opinions are so far. Um, why did they go into Snowflake? I, I want to get maybe some, as I know a couple of people said they are using Snowflake. So I would love to, to hear back. Feel free to unmute yourselves. You know, we can have a conversation. It doesn't have to be just typing in the chat kind of thing, right? right. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then let's talk about it. Mike had two questions, great questions, by the way. Mike, uh, would you like to unmute yourself? And Sure. sure. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Cecilia. Hi, hi Warner. Um, yeah, hi. Hi, though. So I, I, I just wanted to give you, I guess, uh, so the question about why, um, you know, we're using Snowflake. So my, my mm -hmm. company, we use Cloudera right, right now. We have a big data lake, and it's all on the Cloudera um, tech stack, basically. So we're moving away from that because we wanted to be more modern, you know, just get into more like a more modern warehouse situation that's in the cloud. We're on Azure and we're using Office 365. So it was pretty simple decision to make because, you know, we're pretty much, um, you know, like you said, it's, it's easy to easy. integrate. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, and then cost, I think there's going to be some cost savings here. I think that's the, the reason they were trying to get out of cloud air as well. Um, so those are the main reasons, and we're pretty much a Microsoft shop, so we have a lot of, you know, Microsoft tools in place. And because we use Azure um, and we're Office 365, it just was a, a pretty simple decision for us. Yeah. So a couple cool. of questions I got for you. Yeah, uh, go for it. So so one is, I was wondering about, you were going over the T-shirt the sizes. Uh -huh. And what I was wondering about is, does Snowflake, will it auto size for you based on your data volume or do you always, you know, need to select the, the sizes yourself? So, so, so it doesn't, it doesn't auto size the t-shirt size for you. What it can do is that once you select the t-shirt size, if you get more queries at the same time than you thought, it can create more clusters of the same t-shirt size to meet your concurrency requirements, right? So for example, if I have report A, report B, and report C, and each one of those runs okay on an extra small, right? But usually they run at different times of day, but today for some reason, somebody fired them all up at the same time, then Snowflake, can automatically create another extra small cluster for you to run those other two reports, right? Because what we want in that case is not necessarily a bigger warehouse. What we want is just to have more parallelism, 
right? Um, if, on the other hand, it's not that we have reports A, B, and C fired at the same time, but is that we came up with a brand new report that needs to compute four times the amount of data, then you basically got your t-shirt size wrong and you're going to be waiting for a long time, right? That's the problem that Snowflake doesn't optimize for yet, right? Okay. We'll see what they do now. Like I said, I mean, imagine if you're like a company like this and then suddenly you go into the stock market and you get three billion put into your <laughs> balance sheet, right? Look, what do you do with that? Like I, I, this product might look very different in like a year, two years after they've had Oh, a yeah. serious amount of time to do some R and D. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they move into a serverless query model as well, because they have moved into a serverless data loading model now as well. So before it used to be you had to have a warehouse up and running, and you would run a copy command to move data into the warehouse. Now they have this thing called Snowpipe, so it's like a separate serverless service, and you don't have to create a virtual warehouse for it. You just pay for the compute. A snow pipe wakes up when there's a file, it loads it up, and then at the end of the month, you see like, okay, you had, you use these many minutes of snow pipe, and that's it, right? So gotcha. that's, that's I, th I think they might be going or moving into that direction. But today, uh, you have to get the t-shirt size, right, for your average workload. And then if you have an unexpected change in concurrency, you can use the ability to spawn multiple warehouses, but if you just need a bigger t-shirt size, the system's not going to do it for you. You just need a bigger T-shirt size, and you got to go in and do it yourself. Yeah. Okay, got it, got it. Thank you. I have one more, just one more quick question. Yeah, now. go ahead. I'll stop. So, no, no worries. On the so Power BI, we use Power BI, and so we're going to be connecting Power BI to Snowflake. And there's different ways to get data into Power BI. You can import data, but one option is you can run a direct query. So if you run mm -hmm. a direct query, my question is. You were talking about compute and the fact that it can cache kind of the yeah. compute, you know the the SQL that you run. Yeah. So the question is, if you run a direct query in Power BI, do you just pay for that compute one time, or does are you going to be charged every time you kind of open your report and run your report? Well, that's a really good question. Honestly, we would have to figure it out. It's an interesting test to do. I've never actually done the test, but it is possible to test it. the The key would be. Does Power BI change the query text in any way when somebody's running it, right? Uh, even if it's the same data or the same filters, does it add any sort of different ID or something to the query to be able to do something on the Power BI side, right? The, the query text has to be exactly the same to um, to be able to get it from the cache, right? So I don't know if we would have to put in, actually it's not it's not hard to test. You could, if you have Snowflake, right? You can do it yourself. So if, if you go on the, the Snowflake web portal, there's a history tab, right? And the history tab, you can see the whole list of the queries that are running against it. So you can actually go in, fire up your Power BI report, play around with it for a little while, um, and then try to do the same things that you were doing before and see if you see it separate wow. or if you don't see it in the history then you'll just know that it's being served from cache actually it does show up in the history but when you go into the query profile like to basically see the execution plan when it gets there from cache it just has one box that says cache and that's it right gotcha okay great all right cool. thank you very much and, and great presentation yeah. by the way Thanks. Oh, thank so you and let us know what happens mike yeah, I will. I will. Yeah, actually, I'm interested to know. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sh yeah, let us know what happens. And we have more questions. There is yeah, one from sure. Rajiv. He's asking, what are cons? Of cons, software? yeah, of course. No, it's the best product ever. No, of course. So, some things Mike just touched on on one of them, right? So, you have to get the the T-shirt size right of your cluster. So, that's a con. It's not fully serverless, like a product like BigQuery would be, for example. BigQuery, you don't really have to... Um, specify any sizes at all you just query and run and you let google figure out the size that you need right so that's that's a different uh, approach so that would be a con in a way you do have to be able to size your workload to the t-shirt size that you need another con that people might bring up is that snowflake for example compared to synapse for example snowflake doesn't have its own etl 
tool built into it. So you have a you have to still have another tool to extract the data out of your operational systems and then put it into uh, either cloud storage or directly into Snowflake. So even though it's called the Snowflake Cloud Data Platform, they're still missing that piece, right? And that's something that I think marketing and sales doesn't really say too often. And then clients buy it and they open it and they're like, okay, but now how do we get the data in there? And they don't realize that they need the extra piece to just take the data out from their SQL, Oracle, or whatever it is, right? So, um, so that's another con. You do need an extra piece to do that. Um, and then if you are really into the tight integration with all the other stuff that the cloud provider does, well, then usually the cloud providers will themselves be better integrated with their own services because it's their own business, right? So Synapse is going to be better integrated with some of the other data stuff that Microsoft does. Like you can see, for example, Cosmos DB now has uh, no ETL capabilities to Synapse because Microsoft develops both, right? Um, if you want to do Cosmos DB to Snowflake, you still have to do regular ETL because it's a product made by a different company. Uh, same with uh, AWS, right? If you want to have full integration of Redshift to fire events to fire up a Lambda uh, function that you wrote, it's probably going to be easier with Redshift than it is with Snowflake because it's um, it's a first party product from AWS, right? So you have to weigh those uh, cons right against what you're trying to do with Snowflake. It's not a it's not a product that's going to fit everybody because if those integrations are very important for you, then you should go with the first party solution that you pick. But for some people, they might say, well, I don't want to um, actually have so much tight integration to Microsoft because what about if I want to migrate out of Azure and move into AWS one day? Right? Uh, maybe they want to do Snowflake instead. So, like always, you know, trade-offs in tech. The answer is always it depends, right? And you have to sit down, understand what your client's doing, and see if it's a good fit for them or not. Right. Yeah. All right. All let's right. see. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, one more question from Rajiv. Uh, is I'll behind the scene mm -hmm. Snowflake no. is Apache? No, it's, it's, it's proprietary. And actually, if you go into the documentation, it does go a little bit in detail into what they've done. They basically, each table is automatically partitioned by the system into small files called micro partitions. And then they keep all sorts of metadata on these micro partitions to be able to do uh, pretty fast compute against it uh, and that's for the data warehousing piece all, all the orchestration actually this is something that i learned just a couple of days ago all the orchestration and the metadata and uh, you know detecting if a node goes down or it's up or whatever it uses a really interesting distributed database called foundation db i've never even heard of this until i i was watching this presentation a few days ago about it um one of the snowflake engineers was talking about how they manage Snowflake itself, and it was all coordinated to this uh, distributed database called FoundationDB, so very interesting. But the actual analytic compute part is not, it's not Spark, it's proprietary um, built by the Snowflake Oracle guys, well, former Oracle guys, yeah. Um, how difficult is it to move from Redshift to Snowflake? Well, it depends on how difficult, how big is your Redshift um, data, right? Moving data is actually not the hardest part. Probably would be to move the code, right? If you've been using Redshift or Synapse or BigQuery for a while, you probably already developed uh, reports, right? Oh, two terabytes. So moving two terabytes is not the problem. Is not going to be moving the two terabytes. It will be the code, right? The reports that people have run already against Redshift, the the, the store procs, triggers, all this stuff that people develop. You know, the longest that the longer that you've had it, you probably have more and more things, right? And all of these things have to get translated to the Snowflake SQL, right? And maybe some of it will translate pretty easy if it's simple. Maybe some of it won't to require manual rewriting. That's always the painful part. So how easy or not it will be will depend on how much code I think you have there. Not so much about the data. It will be about the code that you will need to translate. Yeah. All right, let's see. Main difference between Snowflake and Polybase. So 
Polybase is a data virtualization tech from Microsoft, which allows you to query all these other, oh, the dog is there, um, <laughs> allows you to query a bunch of different sources and bring it into SQL or in Synapse if you're using the cloud, right? So um, it depends. I mean, if you're thinking of, for example, I just want to query the data remotely, but I don't want to bring it in, then Polybase will let you do that. Snowflake doesn't have that capability. So Polybase can query, go out and query Hadoop or query Oracle and show you the results on SQL Server. And, and you wouldn't keep them, right? So that Polybase has that virtualization uh, you, aspect of it. Polybase can also be used to query and bring it in to Synapse. To do that, you would need in Snowflake to actually do ETL to bring it in, right? So they're not exactly equivalent. Uh, Polybase does, like I said, different things in a different way than Snowflake would do. A Snowflake right now would require you to get the data out and bring it into Snowflake or bring it into cloud storage, where Polybase can allow you to pull the data directly out through the Polybase drivers, right? So a little bit different. Um, let's see, is man machine language AI? Oh, that's a good question, Rajib. That's another con you might have for Snowflake compared to something like Synapse, for example, or Databricks, where you can have machine AI, um, uh, sorry, ML or AI integrated into the product. Because if you guys remember, Synapse has a SQL data warehouse engine and it also has Spark embedded, right? So you can do ML AI directly using Spark inside Synapse. But Snowflake doesn't have Spark or AI ML built into it. So right now you would need to use an external service. It has a connector with Spark, so it will be easy to say, I want to do ML or AI with my Snowflake data. What I have to do, I have to spin up a Spark cluster, use the Snowflake connector, and then do my ML or AI that way, right? So it's not built into Snowflake. You have to use a Snowflake connector and spin up something outside of Snowflake to do it. In AWS, there's a bunch of demos online if you're curious. AWS has uh, SageMaker. Um, there's a bunch of demos online about doing SageMaker uh, training and models with uh, Snowflake data as well. But to your question, yeah, no, it doesn't have it inside. You need something outside. Like I said before, 3 billion, I don't know. They'll probably, maybe they'll throw some ML or AI into it at some point as well. All right, let's see. The name of the dog, what's the name of the dog? Oh, there oh, it is already. Hito. Hito, Hito. Oh, Hito. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's cute. All right. All right. I, uh, I see Mikey's typing. Mikey, if you want to unmute for, uh, to ask something. I was just saying it was a great presentation. Oh, oh thank <laughs> you. Thank you, everybody. Sure. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the last question for the night. Um, mm -hmm. I'm glad. I'm glad that everybody took a little bit of uh, time of their day to join us today. Um, hopefully you got, I know I throw like everything at you and I like, go through the interface showing like a bunch of new concepts and stuff all the time. I, I hope that it was interesting enough for you to try it out because like I said, the trial is really good and you don't have to put in a credit card or anything. All you have to put in is your um, email address and that's it. And they give you 30 days up to 400 bucks of usage. It's a pretty good trial. Um, you can do everything. Uh, if you have Pluralsight, yeah, I have a course in there as well. So you can follow along with the trial and do the course. And it touches on you know, all the stuff, high level, of course. But um, at least to get started is pretty good. And like I said, uh, I'm, I'm seeing the market rise in interest uh, at, uh, at Pythian um, on this particular solution. So you know, if you guys are early learners, there's a certification you can take, by the way. It's called Snow Pro. Um, there's a core level and architect level. I haven't taken the architect one. I hope you know to take it maybe in the next couple of months. It's just the exam is more expensive, but you can take uh, the core one. The core one is just a hundred questions, multiple choice. Um, if you're familiar with data warehousing systems and you just you know you go through the course, you do the trial, you go through the documentation, you can probably um, you know after a month you can probably take the Snow Pro core and pass it. I would say so. Yeah. Yeah, Rajiv, yeah, Rajiv go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, Emmanuel, yes, yeah, yes, Pluralsight yes, is not free. Yeah. Can you um, hear me? But, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go with the last question, then I'll go back yeah, to Emmanuel. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. 
Thank you, Warren, first of all. Thank you so much. It's a really great presentation. And this is the first time I'm I'm, I'm getting the, about the snowflake. Yeah, I that's... am currently Synaptic. I'm working for Synaptics. You said Synapse. Or, and I have <clears throat> struggling with him, with the Synapse, especially uh, considering the report, um, the, how we can use the Synapse uh, you know, we need to we need to pause the synapse. Mostly, company want to pause it, but if we pause, the report doesn't gonna run. So I see that I hear that extra advantage of um, the Snowflake. We don't have to go through the stopping or you know starting and stopping. That's a great facility. Uh, but if I ask you, because you also expert in synapse. Uh, in this in this scenario, you know how the company use synapse. Uh, they they will not go and pause and start every time they start a report, right? How they gonna how they utilize synapse behind the scene? Okay, so so this is not a Snowflake question, it's a synapse question, but I'm gonna answer yes. it anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you look at synapse today, if you go into the workspace preview, there's actually a new SQL on demand engine that will do that it will it will act on demand so it will run per query and you don't have to pause and resume all the time so you probably want to explore that um it is in preview right now i would expect microsoft to put it in ga by the end of the year um so look into that and that might solve your pause and resume problems so oh, okay. think about that yeah so oh, look okay. it up just search for synapse analytics sql on demand okay yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank All you right, so much. Cool. And then free resources. So Emmanuel, yeah, the Pluralsight course that I have, you have to have Pluralsight. You can sign up monthly for Pluralsight. So if you only pay, I don't know, I think it's like $30 or so. Uh, and then you can go through the course. And if you don't want to pay for the next month of Pluralsight, you just cancel. Um, so, but to your point, if you really need free free, then Snowflake in their website, they do have something called the Snowflake University. And it has a bunch of uh, material that you can go through. It's mostly videos and some uh, quizzes. And every so often, if you go on the Snowflake website as well, I think every couple of weeks or so, they do a live um, virtual lab. So you just have to sign up for the trial before. And then they'll have uh, a Snowflake instructor walk everybody through, I think it's about an hour or 90 minutes of just follow along with the Snowflake instructor on your on trial, trial account. account. Yeah, that, that's what I did like a year ago, I think. They used to have uh, workshops from time to time, mm -hmm. like maybe three hours workshop. They provide everything and yeah, that's very yeah, cool. Yes, they still do that. Okay. 